Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's event, taking place towards the end of a frankly rather hectic week for us all, entitled DSA and DMA, Unwrapping What's in Store for Europe, brought to you by DOT Europe and the Information Technology Industry Council. My name is Samuel Stolton. I'm the tech editor at Euractiv, and I shall be moderating today's event. So as part of the agenda this afternoon, we'll be probing the ins and outs of the European Commission's Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act proposals with a couple of specialist panels later on this afternoon, featuring high level EU lawmakers, as well as representatives from industry, civil society and academia. Ahead of those panels, we'll shortly have some opening remarks from Werner Steng, cabinet member as part of executive vice president Margareta Vestaya's team. But before we get all to that, we have a couple of welcoming messages for all our attendees from President of DOT Europe, Stefan Kravchek, and Director General for Europe at ITI, Guido Lobrano. Stefan and Guido, please take the floor. Hello, everybody. Um, this is uh, Stefan from DOT Europe, um, formerly known as EDIMA. Um, very proud that after so many years we've been able to uh, agree on changing a little bit to enter this new decade uh, under the DSA and the DMA. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, ITI for uh, partnering uh, on, this, uh, on this event. I think we're one of the first events after the long-awaited publication of the, the DSA and the DMA. So exciting times. Um, I, uh, I would like to, to underline within the context of what will be uh, probably a very, very uh, passionate and interesting couple of years ahead of us where so many interest groups will weigh in uh, on the adoption process of the beautiful oeuvre that Werner and, and other people at the commission have uh, delivered earlier this week. Uh, beautiful is, of course, meant in, in any way you would like to interpret it um, from my end. Um, Dot Europe, we're a very diverse group of companies. Um, and um, we're a consensus-based organization, which, uh, you know, gives for very interesting discussions and conversations around topics that are covered by both the DSA and the DMA. Um, it may not come as a surprise to the audience and many among you that um, looking at the diversity of our membership, DOT Europe will, going forward, focus mostly, uh, foremost, and if not exclusively, on the DSA rather than the DMA. Um, so we're extremely happy that uh, the Commission decided to separate the two projects so we can weigh in on what uh, is, is, is a topic that we can all agree on amongst the, the DOT Europe uh, membership. Then I also would like to um, commemorate for those who've been long enough amongst us to have uh, been part of the development of the e-commerce directive. And I would like to congratulate Margot Frölinger and Maria Martin Pratt uh, who have gone off to, to different careers um, for the, the future-proof, rock-solid piece of European legislation that they helped producing by now around 20 years ago. It's really kudos to their forward-looking and um, extremely sharp minds uh, that we have a directive that in as far as I can see, at least superficially at first sight, is not that much changed in the proposal uh, under the DSA. And so why is that? Because it was uh, the kind of legislative language that allowed the, the online economy companies to evolve without too much precise prescription about how to do it. It was in a way very result oriented, um, giving a, a framework, but leaving enough room for interpretation uh, to be future proof in light of lightning fast technological developments. And these technological developments are not stopping. 
they're continuing and the world is constantly changing. So I think when we uh, will debate today and go forward with the council, with the parliament, and again with the commission uh, and all the stakeholder groups involved, I think that we should look towards a result-oriented approach that is future-proof. And, and my wish is really that what is already a very interesting proposal um, that we will start debating as of now, um, that we can help with all parties involved to try and depoliticize it and to really work with all the stakeholders on a practical, implementable, workable, but first and foremost, as future proof as the e commerce directive was 20 years ago, uh, a DSA that in 20 years from now we can look back on and still work with and say, we don't need to change that much because it's actually pretty good as it is. And it allows us to grow. And I think particular about the European champions that this commission so much wants to create, allow them to grow within a workable regulatory framework. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. And um, some interesting points there. Let's go for a result oriented approach that's future proof and let's make sure that we depoliticize the debate around the DSA. Thank you very much indeed. I'd like to hand over now to Guido Lobrano. Thank you, Sam, and welcome to all on behalf of ITI. Um, it's, we already have a great attendance. We're very happy about it. Um, also, thanks, Stefan. And you know, let me start by thanking Dot Europe for working with us on the event, and also congratulations on, on the new christening and the name change. Um, I think you know, I want to start by appreciating the efforts by all the speakers to provide a first assessment of these proposals in record time, just you know, a couple of days after their publication. Um, this is also the reason why we joined forces with Dot Europe to provide a, a platform, or an opportunity, maybe better word, to have a first discussion on these proposals in a way that is pragmatic and is also respectful of the European Commission representatives uh, that we know are in, in high demand these first weeks. Um, our associations both represent the most innovative companies in the world, uh, but we also have a lot of different members. So um, as, as you know, it appears from the program, what Siada from Dot Europe will say in the DSA panel, and what I will say later on the DMA will um, solely represent the views of our respective associations. And you know, I felt it was important to make this clear from the beginning. Um, this being said, as ITI representing the world's most leading companies from across all the segments of the tech industry, we certainly recognize uh, our shared responsibility to maintain uh, a safe and competitive and also innovative online environment. And we think this is an opportunity really for all stakeholders in the ecosystem to work together, um, discuss uh, on the best ways to achieve these goals. Now, as, as everyone else, I'm sure, um, I'm really curious and looking forward to hearing from, from Werner, um, who I would also like to thank for joining our event. So Sam, let me stop here. I will save my uh, comments on, on the DMA for the panel. And uh, I hope you will all enjoy the discussion. Thank, thank you so much. Thanks so much, Guido, for your opening remarks there. And now it's time to offer the floor in what I believe is one of the first appearances after the publication of the DSA and the DMA, not necessarily the first, uh, to Werner Steg, of course, Cabinet Member for Executive Vice President, Margareta Vestaya. Thank you very much and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, actually, it's my third appearance after adoption, so it's still a bronze medal, which is not bad. Uh, also, thank you to ITI and Dot Europe for this organization. When I got the invitation, I thought you were partnering with a startup, uh, only now to find out that this is good old Edema. Um, well, Stefan referred to our two proposals as very interesting proposals. I would refer to them um, as major reforms of the digital space. Uh, but like Stefan, I would also hope that they will be valid for the next 20 years, because then I will not have to change them again. But more seriously, those proposals are a major uh, evolution in digital policy making, definitely since the last 20 years, but probably even more profound than that. 
And they're also fully in line with uh, our own digital strategy of earlier this year. If you remember the pre-COVID times still, we had a communication on shaping Europe's digital future, uh, which we think is as relevant as it was at the time. Um, and there already we set out to promote the process of digital transformation. So what you see before you today is definitely not sort of an attempt to stifle innovation in the digital space or to roll back or uh, to slow down the transformation process. On the contrary, that's one of the two priorities of this commission is to promote the process of digital transformation alongside the green transition. But we want this in a way that it maximizes the advantages arising to consumers, to citizens, to businesses of all sizes and, and lines of trade, to society overall. And we definitely want digital technologies to be rolled out in a way and used in a way that respect our, our values, our rights, our laws. Now, the two proposals that you are discussing this afternoon are related, but at the same time, they have a very different purpose and scope which is why there are two different proposals. Uh, obviously, I don't have the time here in this introduction to go into any degree of detail, but let me still give you sort of the, the main direction of travel. The Digital Services Act to start with aims to secure a fully functioning single market for digital services. That is the main regulatory purpose and the e-commerce directive has no longer been able to deliver on that. Why is that? Well, obviously on the one hand, because so many new uh, business models, technologies, also risks associated with those models and technologies have arisen because member states as a consequence have started to address those issues in their own ways, which are obviously fragments the thinking market. And that is what our companies need the most. So if you are the new, the, the, the new digital service of tomorrow, uh, then you need the home market of Europe to scale up and also your business users and the consumers of your business users will need a European market for such services. So that is the fundamental uh, objective of this proposal. How is it going to achieve this? Well, first and probably not even the most important one, uh, the liability framework, which we're harmonizing now in this regulation. So that's the only thing that we take out of the e-commerce directive because the rest stays intact in particular the country of origin principle and everything that goes with it. But the liability framework is being harmonized across Europe in the regulation. It's, it's, it's a bit clarified based on court jurisprudence uh, and some novelties like the Good Samaritan Clause, but basically it has left the principles of the e-commerce directive unchanged. So the liability limitations are still there. The general prohibition or the prohibition, sorry, of general monitoring obligations is still there. So that, that, of course, is really instrumental to the, to the continued evolution and innovation in the digital space. Second, however, we introduce quite a set of due diligence obligations for digital service providers so that they actively mitigate the risks that can be associated with their services. That already entails that the approach is risk-based with different levels of obligations, depending on what you do and what risk can be linked to you. So the mere conduit that doesn't host user-generated content has very few obligations. If you are a hosting service provider where, where, where content is uploaded, you have more, but where this is just limited uh, as in a cloud to, to a limited group of people, still fewer obligations. If an online platform, you host user-generated content and in principle, everybody out there can see that, well, then you have greater obligations. And when you are a very large platforms as defined in the DSA, well, then you have a systemic impact on Europe, on citizens, uh, that we expect even more responsibility and accountability for such services. And thirdly, and by no means least importantly, uh, there's a lot of focus on enforcement. Enforcement has been one of the drivers behind member states or the lack of enforcement or difficulties in terms of enforcement have been drivers behind member states' criticism of the country of origin principle saying, well, laws are not being enforced anymore. Uh, we have to protect our citizens, our consumers, our businesses, whoever, uh, in our own ways. So we have done a lot of thinking and work on coming up with a new framework. It starts, of course, with enforcement at the home state authority. So where the platform is established, we are preserving the country of origin principle, 
but it also means that the home state authority needs to properly enforce the DSA and has quite significant enforcement powers to do that. Second, uh, authorities in, this, in other states where this platform unfolds its effects, they of course also need to be able to enforce national laws and they will differ according to subject matter. Uh, so we're also trying to facilitate the way in which national laws can be enforced vis-a-vis -vis a platform established in another member state, but also in a way that keeps compliance costs down for the platforms. Um, so again, we hope to solve two problems at the same time. And thirdly, we introduce a totally new EU-wide coordination and enforcement structure that where a home state and a host state disagree on whether or not a platform meets the requirements of the DSA, well, those disputes will then come to the European level and be thoroughly discussed and decided upon uh, by these new structures around the board and the national coordinators. Now, the Digital Markets Act uh, obviously has a much more uh, reduced scope. Um, here we're talking about the so-called gatekeepers. Why are the gatekeepers? Well, they are gatekeepers because millions of smaller companies depend on them to do business because they define the rules of the game, uh, who can be on their markets, uh, on what terms, markets that they have created themselves and on which they often compete themselves against those that depend on those markets. Uh, on top of that, this role obviously gives them uh, access to an incredible amount and quality of data because they would know at any point in time who sells what to whom and when and what time and why and why not. So, and if you combine this gatekeeper gateway function with this data privilege, it's not a surprise that some companies have reached a market position, which makes it practically impossible to challenge them. Now to be identified as a gatekeeper platform, first you need to operate on one or more of the so-called core platform services. Uh, and these are the typical things like an online marketplace, uh, search engine, operating system, advertising service, and a few more. And then after that, once you do that, you need to meet three sets of criteria. The first around size and impact on the single market, uh, measured in terms of turnover uh, or market capitalization, and the fact that you operate in more member states, more than three actually. Second, the role that you are playing, and here we're trying to capture this gateway role if you want, that indeed you are needed by, a number, by businesses to reach consumers. And the way to measure that or a proxy for this is of course the users on either side of the platform and in particular on the side of the end users. And thirdly, the question is, uh, do you enjoy an entrenched position of, of market power in those areas? Uh, well, that means that you have managed to do that for quite a while and nobody has been able to challenge that or your user base. But it also contains an element of more flexibility uh, because there's also a qualitative assessment in cases where a potential gatekeeper platform may not yet meet all those quantitative criteria, which still can be rebutted, uh, but may be, can be expected to attain such a, such a level very soon. And then based on a more qualitative assessment, they could also be uh, designated as gatekeepers. What does that mean? Once you are designated a gatekeeper, there is specific behavior that cannot, will not be tolerated anymore because such behavior would close markets off or they are just considered as plain unfair. Um, in other words, the Digital Markets Act contains, and you've all seen the lists in detail, uh, the do's and the don'ts on the use of data, on interoperability, on lock-in, on self-preferencing. Um, but you all have the documents in front of you and can read this for yourself. Last but not least, the DSA also contains still more flexible ways of adapting to change. Uh, Stefan referred to this constant uh, rhythm of change in the digital world. So with the market investigation tool, not only can the list of gatekeepers be kept up to date, but also to see whether there's other platform services that emerge uh, that show the same characteristics as the one that are currently in scope, or whether there's new practices emerging uh, that are not yet in any of the lists, which of course have been inspired more by past and present behavior that we have seen in many, especially law enforcement cases. 
just to add at the end that these proposals, um, and I think that has been misperceived in some quarters, they're not, a, they're not a directed against anybody. They're not uh, there to, they're, they're not anti-tech proposals, let alone anti-US proposals. They are here to work in favor of someone. Who is that someone? It's the citizen. It is to improve the lives of 450 million citizens in Europe. We want to make them make sure that they feel safe when they buy stuff online or safer than today. We want to protect their freedom of speech online. We want to help them to better understand why they see online what they see online. These are all serious concerns of many, many users of the internet. And we're trying to address those as best as we can. But we also want to improve the lives of, of millions of businesses, small and large, which may today for instance, be competing with rogue traders from other countries, other continents selling into Europe. We have to compete with cheap products that don't meet any of our product standards that may be counterfeit, so there's a level playing field. It is business users of platforms that need them to, 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 to reach consumers, or it may be innovative startups and other companies that are trying to compete with the platforms, but may be confronted with anti-competitive behavior. So these, are, these issues have been addressed and ident no, not addressed, but identified all over the globe. And American consumers and citizens are complaining about these issues also to us, by the way, as much as European ones. But it doesn't matter where the large platforms are established. What matters is that the negative repercussions of their activities are properly addressed. Which brings me to my very last point, but important, I think, and that's democracy. What the DSA and the DMA have in common is that private companies have obtained a role in our society and economy, which enables them to take decisions for each and every one of us, whether any other company has a fair chance to offer their products to consumers, whether we as citizens will ever see these products, or generally whether we citizens have a, have a chance to influence the type of content or information that is shown to us or hidden from us. And we're trying to rebalance these relationships, that the rules applying to the digital world um, are defined in the public interest uh, and obtain democratic legitimacy. And in that sense, I agree with Stefan, it's very good to have this debate. You may agree and you will agree and disagree with parts of our proposals, which is obvious. But it's good that we are having a democratic debate about the internet that we want to have tomorrow. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, Werner, for your opening remarks there. And uh, interestingly, that you should uh, end on the point about democracy and the fact that certain private companies have allowed themselves to take decisions for every one of us. Uh, very interesting point. And I'm not sure it's one entirely that the companies themselves are actually comfortable with having that much authority. So perhaps we can get more into the detail of that type of a responsibility later on as part of our panels. Um, and then just coming back to a couple of the points on the DSA you mentioned, particularly about enforcement, which I found uh, particularly interesting uh, on this new coordination structure and the digital services coordinators that will be brought together under a new board to ensure that there is efficient enforcement of these rules. Um, that will be very interesting to see how it works in practice. You can kind of see the parallels with uh, GDPR and how that enforcement structure takes place across the block. So um, hopefully we'll be able to get more into the granular details of those points there as part of our next panel. And uh, today's uh, discussions around the DSA and the DMA uh, will take the form of two sessions. The first of which, as I just said, focuses on the Digital Services Act. Um, just a few housekeeping notes before we start. Um, we will have a short break after the first panel um, to give you a bit of time to make yourself an afternoon coffee before we start on the DMA later on in the afternoon. Um, but the first session we're going to talk about the ins and outs of the Digital Services Act. And just to let you know, these panel sessions are being recorded and they will be available for download after the event. Of course, all the mics and cameras of audience members have been turned off by default. Um, after we've had some brief opening statements from our panelists, 
we'll engage in a discussion on the most pressing issues related to both proposals in the panels. And we really want you to get involved in the debate too. So if you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom and let us know who your question is directed to. If at any point you have technical difficulties in following the stream, please don't hesitate to reach out to us uh, send a message to Jennifer Bodie or send an email to J Bodie, that's J B O D I E at itic.org. So, without further ado, I think it's just about time to get started with our first panel, honing in on the Digital Services Act. And for this session, I'm very pleased indeed to unveil a stellar lineup, including MEP Karen Melchior of the Renew Europe group in the European Parliament. We also have Ricardo Castanera, digital councillor at the Portuguese permanent representation, of course, the next presidency of the EU Council. We're also joined by Werner McGowan, Europe director of the Centre for Democracy and Technology. And we also have Saida El Ramli, director general of DOT Europe. So welcome to our panelists here this afternoon. We're going to begin with some very short opening statements before engaging in a more in-depth discussion. And to kick us off, I'd first like to start with Karen. Thanks a lot, Samuel. And thank you very much for hosting this event so shortly after and, and rescheduled after the rescheduled launch of the, the DSA. I think it's great that we finally have our Christmas gift that we can spend the holidays unpacking. We've been waiting for this since, uh, since we, the start of the mandate. And I'm happy that it's risk-based and, and that we have um, a selection of platforms that is not all rules should apply to all platforms, but that there is a difference between the sizes. And one of the other things that I like to see is that there is an obligation to have risk mitigation so that the due diligence of the platforms is not either you have no obligations at all concerning the content or you have all obligations, but that there is a, you're asked to look at what are the risks based on the content curation that you as a platform are providing. However, I would have liked there to be a little bit more handholding of the platforms when they're doing this. It seems like it's very much uh, up to how the platforms themselves wish to do this. The risk mitigation aspect was one of the issues that we addressed in our own initiative report in the Yuri Committee in the, in the European Parliament. Other things that I like about the proposal is that the opportunity for the Commission to give fines, which will help reinforce the implementation of the, of the regu regulation. And also that we now have a notice and action system that will be put in place that is quite clear for all users or recipients of information, which is not the case in all member states at the moment. However, I think that there are some issues to be ironed out when we go through the process of approving this piece of legislation. One of the issues that I'm a little bit concerned about is the trusted flagger system, because you have the opportunity of being a trusted flagger as a national authority. And this opens up for authorities to avoid using court and police based and notices for illegal uh, content and sort of blurs the lines. And also I, the, digital, um, the digital coordinators in the individual member states, I'm not quite sure how keen they would be on regulating other national authorities uh, and their decisions. One concern also is the nomination of trusted flaggers nationally, where you could see a restriction of fundamental rights if, for example, a trusted flagger was an organization that um, seeks to restrict the rights of others. Uh, you could, for example, with the LGBTI situation in, for example, Poland, I would be afraid of having a trusted flagger as somebody upholding conservative family values because I, in my view, that would restrict the, the rights of LGBTI persons there. Other issues is also when you have the notice given by a trusted flagger, what does that do to the um, diligence of, due diligence obligations um, 
from the, the platforms because does an, a notice automatically make the platform aware of the content and are they then supposed to take, take the content down uh, without any due delay? And also the combination of Article 26 and 27, may, I'm a little bit afraid that it will allow for upload filters as the only realistic way of fulfilling the requirements there. And also what happens if the process concerning the content has been fulfilled? Does the platform still have an obligation to, um, to, re to keep an eye on that um, content? Also another issue before I end is the country of origin principle, which is still there, but it seems like there have been left some loopholes allowing for more national uh, legislation such as um, the NetCG in Germany and also uh, the Aviva law in France and the upcoming legislation in, in Austria. And also finally, I mean, there is, there is a little bit of a lack of ambition in the proposal concerning targeted advertisement and also the type of algorithms that the platforms are allowed to use, uh, where there is no real option of having a more neutral algorithm, allowing you to not be encouraged to spend more time on the platform than necessary. And I think this is um, a one-time opportunity for us to regulate the platforms and regulate the internet of today and hopefully the internet of tomorrow and we shouldn't lose this thank you great wonderful thank you for your opening statement there karen uh, i have to say my heart skipped the beat when you said upload filters again and uh, copyright just came all flooding back um we'll have to see a bit later on whether some of our representatives from the industry would uh, uh how they would react to that idea of perhaps um having to oblige with upload filters um, as part of the new measures. But thank you for your opening statements. Uh, Ricardo, I'd like to turn to you now from the Portuguese Pernre. Well, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you, Samuel. Thanks to ITI and thanks to Dot Europe for the very kind invitation. It's always a great pleasure. Um, well, just a very short two minute uh, opening remarks. I would say that uh, after a, a long wait, we finally have the DSA proposal. I think that the, the proposal delivers on the major elements that the parliament, the member states and the stakeholders have been calling for. It means a, a modern set of rules for the digital space to create a safe online environment for users, increasing transparency and strengthening the enforcement governance. I think that it's fair to say that uh, most of these aspects are included in the proposal. I would recall that uh, Vice President Verstager she used the metaphor to describe the DSA, which it's like when traffic lights were set up to avoid the chaos created by the increasing number of cars on the roads. And um, I believe this is a very, very good metaphor because uh, it means the need to bring order to the disruptive chaos that major technological devel developments um, in, in, in event bring to our individuals' lives and, so, and society as a whole. And um, that is the goal. And after hearing once again, uh, Bernard, uh, this is the goal of the DSA and also the DMAs, especially on the DSA, to ensure that society is protected in the digital world as well as in the offline world and make sure that the rules that we are designing now are feature proof and are a strong pillar of our digital single market. As incoming presidency, um, I must remind that we've defined three underlying principles for the digital policy and which will broadly guide our national position on the DSA and DMA. First, the digital transition is a strong driver for the economic recovery and a unique opportunity to strengthen the single market. Second, digital empowerment of citizens, especially consumers and businesses, must be sustained by a trustworthy and ethical digital context. And uh, enhance, we need to enhance Europe's role as a global digital reference. That's why, as incoming presidency, we will give top, top priority to both uh, proposals, the SA and the MA. And our goal is to steer the beginning of the negotiations and move forward with these important legislation. Samuel. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Ricardo, there for your opening statement. And uh, of course, you will have six months as part of the uh, Portuguese presidency starting in January. And it will be really exciting to see how far you manage to get and how you uh, bridge the divides between various member states on their different stances and opinions. But hopefully we can get into the more granular details with regards to any disputes or divisions within the council a bit later on. 
Uh, I'd now like to turn to Iverna McGowan from the Centre for Democracy and Technology for her opening statement. Uh, thank you so much and good afternoon everybody. I am indeed from the Centre for Democracy and Technology, head of our Brussels office here and for those who might not be familiar, uh, we're a not-for-profit organisation that works to protect individual rights and democracy in the digital age and thank you to our, our other speakers today as well. So I share actually um, to uh, our member of the European Parliament who joined us, I think we're at some very interesting points. Uh, this is a once in a generation opportunity to get something right. And at the beginning, we talked about how 20 years ago, what a good job they did in future proofing the e-commerce directive. I would also like to remind everyone, however, that the political momentum for change and updating came primarily from a public interest perspective. And we should all keep that front and center as we analyze and, and look at um, these new proposals. So the Center for Democracy and Technology, um, our first analysis, and of course there will be more given the short timeline, is that there are, is there are provisions there that we certainly welcome that were cornerstones of the e-commerce directive, um, such as a, a, you know, a clear liability framework for intermediaries, Good Samaritan principle, those points that allow people to you know, participate and engage online. At the same time, as we've seen in the last years that the situation has gotten more complex, we also welcome the ambition in other areas by the Commission. So there is clear points on increasing transparency. Um, there is a nod to some of the challenges around a, the use of personal data for advertising. And there's also a general approach that acknowledges that we need more redress, um, more information for users, that, that's all generally positive. Where we are concerned is, uh, and this comes back to this broader rule of law principle. And again, you know, the, the example of Poland and LGBTI, I think really drives home the importance of the rule of law and public interest in, in a more general way. The fact is, is that when we water down in any way, these safeguards in the public interest with public oversight, it is always, and we've seen that time and time again, the most vulnerable uh, who will be at risk of that. So we really need to uh, be careful of that. And our concern, as has been echoed by other speakers, is that there's a bit of a confusing role, actually, for intermediary liabilities in this first draft. Um, perhaps that wasn't fully intentional. We're, we're looking at it as lawyers reading through each provision. But on one hand, you do have um, provisions that would be very clear on a, you know, the, the role of intermediary intermediaries and then in other places with the due diligence uh, points and in particular with this option for basically anybody to give notice as we see in article 14 we're worried that that really leaves this really complex and important point of the the question of legality of speech um, that that's being left to platforms and that undermines a key rule of law principle um, it's also the case that there's a number of provisions that will lead inevitably to more automated use. And we also, again, know that some au different automated filters can have a disproportionate negative impact on certain vulnerable groups. So I would say that we really, we, we see that there are very, you know, positive ambition and key principles there. At the same time, the devil will be in the detail. We would really like to see a strong and stable um, intermediary liability framework in particular. And we also think that getting that notice and action part right so that it does, it both protects free expression, but also gives access uh, to remedy for people who might suffer harassment and others, that that's done properly and clearly, but also that the public oversight and accountability point gets um, more central attention because we are concerned that when we read the provisions at the moment, that that's just not quite right. Thank you, I'll, I'll have more later. Thank you, Ivana. Thank you so much. Some concerns there raised over intermediary liability, particularly with regards to notice and action mechanisms. Uh, are platforms being, will they be asked to police our speech to an extent which erodes fundamental rights? Hopefully we can get onto that in a bit more detail later on. Uh, for our final opening statement now, I'd like to turn to Siada El Ramli from Dot Europe. Thanks, Samuel. Thank you to all the speakers so far for their interventions. And I'm actually going to probably react to a few as, we, as, as I do my opening remarks. But let me first just quickly point out the opportunity that we have ahead of us here with the DSA. It's an ambitious proposal. The Commission hasn't just resorted to reopening the e-commerce directive 
in a way that a lot of us had expected a couple of years ago. They're trying to actually come up with a framework that's more robust in dealing with content moderation. As an organization, that's what we've been calling for for about a year now, um, to have an online responsibility framework come off the ground. Um, and so that's all very welcome from our side, but we do think that it's conditional on a, cu a couple of elements. One is that we keep the focus on the work that we're doing as we're going to start doing our advocacy going forward, and that we really look at it from the perspective that this is going to replace Articles 12 to 15 of the e-commerce directive plus, but there's already so much in the proposal, so trying to add even more to it might just divert our attention unnecessarily. And we would like to see this actually end up in a practical, pragmatic solution. The other, the other thing is coherence. How do we make sure that the DSA remains coherent with some of the existing legislation and obligations that are already in place? Um, some of the ones that are also coming in now with initiatives or, propose, or legisl legislative pieces that only passed through the end of the last mandate. So we're in the starting points of the implementation phase. And by that, I mean, for example, on the transparency side, um, there are issues that obligations that we've already got under the platform to business proposal or un, under the consumer omnibus um, that require explainability and how is explainability difference to transparency and how will the obligations under the DSA fit in with that and it, making sure that it's all coherent that we're actually working in the same direction. To continue the positive line, obviously the fact that it's going to be a harmonizing piece is something that we very much welcome. And the approach that the commission has taken to balance the stakes, focus on systemic breaches as opposed to individual breaches. Um, it's, um, as I said, not just focusing on just updating the rules, but coming up with a result oriented framework but it does leave a lot of questions still to be answered. Some of the previous speakers also mentioned areas that we'll need to work, work on, but how will the digital service coordinators work with some of the other co-regulators that are coming into play under the Euro European Democracy or uh, Euro European Democracy Action Plan? There was a reference to the DSA putting forward, uh, forward a co-regulatory backstop for disinformation, which is not always illegal content. Um, the terrorist content regulation, the competent authorities there, how will the, the, the digital uh, service coordinators work with them? Uh, with regards to the board, I don't see a role for technical expertise being injected into that group. Is there a possibility for not only the industry bringing technical expertise, but for example, civil society to have an advisory role there from time to time as well. Has that been something that has been looked at? Um, the platforms or the intermediaries as a whole don't work in a void. We work together with other stakeholders when it comes to content moderation, yet they're not the target of this piece of legislation. So for example, on trust, trusted flaggers, will there be transparency reports for tr trusted flaggers? to show who they are, what they're doing, what the results are of the flags that they actually provide. Um, on access to data, on the transparency rules, um, what kind of transparency do we need to give to which group? Give access to some kind of information to the regulators as opposed to the commission as opposed to researchers and what safeguards are there in place for the companies when it comes down to proprietary information, which is also key and needs to be respected. So I think it's a great start. I think it's going to keep us all very busy for at least the next couple of years. Um, but I think there are lots of questions that we want to ask in the next few, few months. And I'm sure we all will have these questions and I'll stop there then. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Siada. And I want to kind of take some of what you said to give us a bit of a momentum going forward into our discussion now. And just a reminder as well to our audience tuning in all over the world, please submit your questions into the chat. I can see a, a few coming through now and we will get to them a bit later on. Um, content. 
and thinking about this new trusted flaggers idea, um, this is something that Karen Melchior uh, addressed earlier as well as a potential issue, and I would like Yvonne McGowan also to comment on this. Th these trusted flaggers have been described as certain entities with expertise and competence who will be able to report illegal content to the platforms to which they will have to react uh, with urgently. Um, do you think there could be some issues here related to the election of trusted flaggers? Um, and Karen, you, you mentioned that there could be issues with regards to maybe the political connections that such trusted flaggers would have to various governments uh, across the European Union. Maybe you could say a bit more about your concerns with regards to that, and then we can bring in Iverna to talk about how this could undermine uh, freedom of speech. Karen. Thank you very much. Yes, it the fact that you can have a public authority that is a trusted flagger, I think that blurs the line between the government responsibility of ensuring the fundamental rights for all of its citizens and also citizens of, of other countries using services from their country and um, upholding, of course, the law of the land at home. But it, if you have, and that the political sort of instructions that are given to public authorities will not be kept in check as much by the um, digital services coordinator as they would if it was a private entity or part of civil society. And that is part of the worry that you can have public authorities that are trusted flaggers. And then also, if you look at the role of the trusted flaggers and the requirement for the platforms to, without undue delay or very fast, uh, that they take down content. I'm quite concerned that this can have a chilling effect on democracy online because the platforms will feel encouraged to remove more content than perhaps necessary legally and rather than leaving it up and risk the consequences. And this has been part of the debate I'm, from from last mandate, I won't mention I won't mention the war, but this is still a worry when we look at the regulation and how to regulate the internet. And then also, as was mentioned by uh, Saida uh, concerning the board uh, and also the commission role, what will what will their possibilities of enforcing these things actually be? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, Iverna, I just want to turn to you now on the subject of the trusted flaggers. Um, Karen Melchior said there that it could undermine democracy online. Um, do you think that platforms with this type of a framework um, could be incentivized to remove content perhaps more liberally than they would do normally with these um, trusted flaggers? So, Jen, I mean, overall on the regulation beyond the trusted flaggers, given uh, I believe we may have lost Iverna there for just one moment. We'll wait. Is she back with us? You're back. Have another go, Iverna. Sure. So um, I was just saying that overall, there's a number of um, concerns that we would have in relation to um, that there are the fact that there are increasing amount of liabilities placed on companies, plus this kind of obligation to make decisions on legality, that that combined effect can have a chilling effect on, on kind of, I guess the overall pushes on takedowns rather than on what needs to stay up. So that's an overall point. And then the question of trusted flaggers, I think the word trust is really important. Where does public trust comes from? It comes from, again, rule of law, clear checks and balances on power and appropriate institutions making the correct calls and decisions. So there is a constellation within which trusted flaggers could be you know, a useful tool. But again, we need to be very, very careful that the question, the clear question on legality of speech has to remain really with the judiciary and courts. Um, and then that kind of in between part, as, as we call the, the so-called lawful but awful piece, we need to make sure that actually we don't disincentivize uh, good and transparent content moderation for those parts as well. I would equally be share the concerns that pinning public authorities as trusted flaggers actually has serious rule of law consequences because it's kind of, it's actually 
um, you know, it's clearly taking away a role that's usually in, in the hands of the judiciary exclusively and could be giving it to another government agency, which is, is a clear violation of the rule of law. So that part might need rethinking. We could use trusted flaggers in certain, there, there could be a possible role for them, but there are concerns about the way the current draft is, is done. Mm -hmm. Saida. Thank you, Samuel. Uh, it's just in, in response to Averna's point, and I don't have an answer to it, but I do have a, a response there on, uh, we've always said we don't want to be the judge and jury of legality or illegality of content. That's not our role to play. And I would entirely agree with you that, that we should leave it up to the judiciary. The only thing is, how do we actually get this done in an efficient and quick manner to make sure that we still act quick enough. And I think that's why I'm saying I don't have the answer. It's just been one of these things that I've been mulling over. How do we keep the judiciary in there on individual cases? Because on systemic, uh, on, on a systemic level, we probably can, because we'll have guidance. But on an individual level, how, how do we make this work? Would be more my question. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Saida, for your intervention there. Um, Ricardo, this is a subject that really is about all EU member states with regards to the trusted flaggers and the competencies of the national authorities. Um, more generally, of course, you're taking your seat at the head of the EU Council in January. Um, I'd like to ask you about the, firstly, about have you got any uh, meetings scheduled to, to discuss the DSA and DMA as it stands currently? Um, I believe there is a telco council at the start of, January early on. I'm not sure if it will come up in that one or in a, another council configuration. Um, you've said this is a priority for your presidency. What are you planning to do within the six months that you have um, at the top of the EU council? And which parts of the DSA do you envisage could create divisions and disagreements among member states? Well, first of all, it's um, important to note that we will table the discussion of the DSA at the internal market working party, okay, and not the telecom one. Um, and the DMA will be tabled at the competition working party, but uh, both files will fall under the Compet Council. Um, this is a, an important information, Samuel. Then, uh, and we will start immediately uh, on the first week of January, um, setting up discussions on, on, on both uh, working, uh, working parties. But Regarding your question about uh, <laughs> who, uh, how, how, what about the divisions and disagreements among member states, well, I, I wish I would have a crystal ball to understand that. But um, so far, so far, there has been a lot of alignment on the most essential points. I would say um, the need to update the rules, to maintain the core principles of the e-commerce directive, to set up a clear responsibilities for online plan for platforms, and also to strengthen the enforcement. I there is uh, around those uh, the main subjects a, a strong, strong alignment. Um, and uh, so as of now, of course, the member states, they've yesterday uh, welcomed different, uh, and today also in different working parties, um, welcomed the proposal, um, agree on its horizontal nature that has been already raised by some other panelists um, uh, for internal market or harmonization of the rules, which is a very, very important uh, aspect too. But the discussion is only at the beginning, <clears throat> and as someone else already mentioned, the devil is in the the devil is in the details. And um, of course, we we have not had enough time to to go through all the details. But of course, um, I I I, yes, I think that we all know that some member states, for example, would prefer tackling harmful content in the DSA, with others would rather have it limited to le illegal content as it is. So this could be a point of possible disagreement. Probably the fact that the know your business uh, uh, customer principle um, just applies to marketplaces um, can also be another hot topic. Um, and for example, the, the missing stay down mechanism can be subject of uh, strong discussion too, just to identify three probably or potential um, uh, subjects to be to 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 be strongly strongly discussed but by now i believe that everyone is uh, focused on reading carefully the proposal we will put a lot of questions to the commission for sure um, and then samuel uh, you should ask me again in june <laughs> because our goal is really to start the negotiation but uh, carry them uh, through a good path and uh, present a, a very good report um, at the compact council by may
<laughs> Needless to say, I think uh, six months is far too short of a timeline <laughs> to make the progress, I suppose, that we all really want. Um, Saida, I'd like to come to you on the, um, the scope really now of, of so-called VLOPs, very large online platforms who will of course bear the brunt of the more stringent requirements as part of the DSA. What do you make of the metrics used to determine this scope for VLOPs? So the fact that we've got um, a proportionality principle embedded in there is something that we're, we very much welcome. We also ask for that ourselves. In our own online respo uh, responsibility framework, we also uh, we're, we're asking for proportionality, depending on the impact of the service, not necessarily of the entity, but rather of the service uh, provided and the impact that it has with the content that it disseminates. And in that, taking that into consideration, just having the very large platforms as the key criteria might seem a little bit, for want of a better word, a, a bit crude, a bit drastic, um, and we would have liked to have seen it be more nuanced to really tailor it around the service provision rather than the size of the entity. Um, but yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, Karen Melchior, what's your take on the, the size of the entity here? Because we heard a lot, in fact, we heard some contrasting messages really from the, the commission leading up to the presentation that it won't necessarily be about size, but it's quite clear that some sort of a metric system has been used that will um, impose the most stringent restrictions on these so-called VLOPs. What's your take on the scope? I think it's a little bit restrictive scope uh, in that there is a very large, you need to have a lot of users uh, to reach the 45 million per month, active users per month. And I think it is only the largest platforms that will uh, reach that criteria. As far as I recall the presentation by the commission at the press uh, conference, there were a number of other uh, criteria as well. And it seemed like you could fulfill um, a handful of, a couple of these, and this would qualify you as a, as a very large online platform. Uh, VLOP sounds like one of those uh, unhealthy jelly, <laughs> gel toys for kids that you should uh, try to avoid getting imported because they don't um, adhere to uh, EC um, regulation. So I think it's, we need to have clear criteria for which platforms we're targeting. And we need to make sure that we're not only targeting one, two or three, because the demands that we will be making on the very large platforms are going to be necessary also to ensure user rights and not um, distorting competition in uh, for other platforms as well. I've been meeting with some platforms that are very big on their home market within the European Union, but say that we should have a look at the global uh, turnover, the global amount of users and not just the national or the European amount of users. And I think that can risk end up distorting um, the competition situation in a country such as Portugal, if you have a very large platform there that is not large at a global scale. Um, and, and that is some of my concerns in the definition of these platforms. And I, I hope that we can find a better word for them. Otherwise I'll be thinking of American rap and WAP rather than VLOPs. Yeah, I think they can do better than VLOPs. Um, I would be remiss not to ask Siada while she's here, with regards to your own members, how many of them envisage that they would come under this VLOPs scope? I haven't had a chance to check in with all of them, but I think a considerable part of our membership would fall within the scope. But definitely, I, I wouldn't say half of them. Okay, which would be, I mean, around... Half, how many is that in number? So we've got, sorry, we've got 20 members as of today. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, Ivana, I'd like to ask you a bit about um, empowerment now, really, because I suppose a lot of this is about making sure that users are empowered in their relationship with the, with the platforms. And of course, this is dependent on how many platforms comes under the scope of the more stringent measures. When we think about this, relationship and balance of power between the users and platforms themselves do, does the dsa as it currently stands level out this relationship a bit and do you believe that users will be empowered in this new relationship 
Uh, so thank you, Samuel. There are, there's some indications in, in that direction, like I mentioned. So um, th there's an emphasis on transparency for users over algorithms and over what's going on procedurally in, in terms of, of takedown of content, etc. But again, my concern would be that overall, because so much uh, responsibility is going back upon the platforms, for example, this point about, um, you know, the incentive maybe to take down too much, that that could actually, you know, have the opposite effect. Another point that we haven't discussed too much yet, which I think is important, is that from across civil society, there's been a lot of concern about the use of personal data, the extent of the use of personal data driving online advertising. And there has been some points to that um, in the Digital Services Act. Um, and I heard earlier this morning, we heard from another commission colleague who had said that actually there hasn't been as much in there because what they would like to do is to see stronger enforcement of GDPR, which is also elements of that are complemented in, in the DSA. And then very briefly, finally, just to pick up on the point later, because you know the, I think what's key is that it, it, it can be too black and white sometimes. We mentioned, oh, how can we possibly have so many courts and make so many decisions? But that's exactly why this Good Samaritan principle is so important. So what the Good Samaritan principle does is that it shields intermediaries from liability to do content moderation on you know, lawful content um, and that's really important. And then we also need to remember that it's not just, our, our concern is, is that if there's too much of a focus on liabilities leading to take down, that you, you, you lose that nuance that we've learned about is so important over years to, you know, flag something as maybe being questionable information, temporarily suspend something. You lose those different degrees before saying, oh, actually, this is really now a question of legality and where does that go? Or this is a case under... Um, anti-harassment or other points like that. So we're just really concerned to get that balance in the ecosystem right, that users do not feel like suddenly something is taken down and there's a very burdensome procedure, or, or equally people who have a uh, genuine concern have their access. So I think that there's definitely promising uh, points that we, we, we can work on here, but at the moment we're a little bit concerned that that emphasis again on takedown would actually, contrary to some of the ambition, have the opposite effect for users. So it'll, the devil again will be in the detail on those points. Mm -hmm. Ivana, I just wanted to take up one of the points that you made at the beginning of your intervention there on the subject of um, online advertising. And maybe I can turn this question to Ricardo, actually, because what we see in the DSA is effectively more uh, transparency obligations with regards to online advertising. And what, what are the political ramifications of this um, emphasis on transparency, particularly uh, in the world of online advertising? Of course, there has been no shortage in the past of political advertising in particular being used on social media to coerce or confuse voters. Uh, Ricardo, do you think that the new rules for transparency in the DSA are address this issue that we have faced so many times in the past, Brexit and other national elections all across the EU? Yes, yeah, Samuel, indeed. Um, but we all know that the issue of online advertising, for example, was included also on the, at the European Parliament report by the MEP team of Vulcan, for, for example. It is, of course, a, a big concern for policymakers. Um, and, and we need to ensure that citizens are not subject to online manipulation of any sort, whether political or commercial. Um, this is a very, very sensitive issue and an extremely, extremely complex one from a political, but also from a legal point of view. Um, we think that the DSA uh, uh, proposal includes transparency uh, requirements for online advertising. Users will have to be informed about the identity of the advertiser as well for the subgroup of very large platforms, the ones that uh, we've already discussed, a very large number of of users, the publication of a repository with information on advertisement. Plus, the proposal, the DSA, also includes measures to assess systemic risks and to adopt mitigation measures. We still have to see the details about these provisions, of course, but uh, this is a very good start, I believe. In any case, um, Samuel, um, we should not forget that the DSA is just a um, uh, one piece of regulatory evolution that we've just started in the EU, but the DSA is not the only uh, legislation uh, which is in 
important here in this aspect. Um, uh, for example, uh, Commissioner Vestrager and, and Breton, they've, uh, they've already pointing out that there are other very important initiatives, for example, the Democracy Action Plan or 